Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 326 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Walter John Williams. He's the author of over 30 novels in a wide range of genres, including Hardwired, Aristoi, Implied Spaces, and Quillifer. He's also published three short story collections and is a regular contributor to the Wildcard series of Shared World Superhero Anthologies. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new novel, The Accidental War, the latest volume in his Praxis series of military space opera. And now here's our interview with Walter John Williams. All right, so we're here with Walter John Williams. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay, so your new book is called The Accidental War, and it's the latest volume in the Praxis series. So just tell us yes. a bit about how this series first came about. Well, uh, we have to go back into the mists of time about 20 years when Caitlin Blaisdell, who was uh, then an editor at HarperCollins, said that she would like to see a space opera from me. And uh, so creative people generally have are thinking about like any one of a dozen projects at a time. And, uh, you know, I, I have come up with by now more projects than I will ever have time to write. So which project I choose at any given time depends on the level of interest from publishers. And uh, I had been thinking about a space opera series. It was kind of down a few numbers in my list, but I sort of brought it up to the front of the list and uh, and sold it. She liked my ideas. And uh, and then that was the first three books of the Praxis series. Um, I decided to do... Um, to do space opera straight. I mean, I was, I wanted to do a big, wide scale, uh, old fashioned, if you like, or classical, or probably be better, a classical space opera, which involved, uh, a large starscapes and alien worlds and alien races and high stakes. And I always wanted to, also wanted to take advantage of the opera section, uh, um, a piece of the term. Um, I wanted to, the action to be big and dramatic uh, and operatic. And so that was my initial idea. Now, had you written any other space opera prior to that in short stories or, or novels or anything? Um, I thought I had. Hmm. Uh, I, there's a, a, a book called Aristoi, um, which came out in uh, 1992, I think, which I kind of viewed as a post-cyberpunk take on space opera, but I'm not sure if anyone else actually got that. Now, so when this editor said she wanted a space opera from you, was space opera, was it making a resurgence, or, or why do you think that she asked for that specifically? Uh, you know, I never asked her. I just said, thank you, I'll get right on it. Um, so, uh, but I, I don't, there had been a phenomenon called the new space opera, which had started in the early 80s. Uh, uh, possibly with Ian Banks. And, uh, but uh, sort of in order to be a writer of new space opera, I think you had to be British. Um, if you were American, they gave it another label. And I think that's what happened with my Aristoi. Um, and that had, that had created some, some stir, uh, in the science fiction universe. But, uh, I don't think there was a huge resurgence of space opera, uh, going on. 18 or 20 years ago. I don't seem to recall it. <laughs> now, you got your start writing these historical naval novels, sort of in the mode I did. of uh, Horatio Hornblower or Jack Aubrey. Um, yes, yes, I did. And, and it seems like the praxis is, is sort of like that set in space. Is that a fair description of it? Uh, there are elements of it, yeah. Um, because I, I used to be a naval historian, you know, I was able to take uh, elements of, uh, naval history and apply them to, um, into the future. Um, and, uh, but it's, for instance, um, David Weber does the same thing with the Honor Harrington stories, but he sort of goes out of his way to give his characters technology that sort of requires them to imitate the, um, the, the tactics of a Napoleonic naval battle. And 
uh, I didn't do that for one thing. David Weber had already done it. Hmm. So uh, the well, the, the hierarchies um, and the aristocracy uh, are can be derived from history. Um, the actual ships are uh, plausible uh, interstellar craft with um, antimatter missiles as their primary weapon, and the tactics that they use are, uh, I suppose, may have a remote ancestry to uh, historical naval actions, but uh, once you convert it to three dimensions and add all of these new weapons, uh, it doesn't resemble uh, the Battle of uh, Trafalgar at all. I mean, would you say that there are other historical periods that you were draw sort of plucking details out to help form this universe? Yeah, well, I was I was thinking of empires specifically because I wanted uh, to set this in a space empire, and uh, space empires have kind of been grandfathered into science fiction uh, from the 20s, and of course, in the 1920s, there actually were empires on Earth. You know, the British Empire co covered two fifths of the globe supposedly, so uh, it wasn't implausible that this sort of political arrangement could, would continue into the future, but I think. Uh, the problem is that I don't think space empires make an, a, a whole lot of sense, actually. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, people widely spaced, and, and so there, there has to be some other, um, some other thing going on. I mean, people don't just say, I'm going to join an empire today. So, uh, especially, um, you know, planets that are months out of contact with each other. Uh, and so uh, my thought was um, that this space empire was going to be created and run by aliens, and uh, they were not going to uh, – and, and for ideological reasons, they would craft this empire, not because an empire necessarily makes sense uh, in terms of the, the technology and the great distances involved, uh, but they had an overriding ideology, which I called the praxis. Uh, which they wanted to spread to all of intelligent life in the universe. Uh, and so that was the creation of this empire. Um, it was an alien creation. Uh, all of the various other species of the empire, including the humans, uh, were under the command of this particularly ruthless alien species. So therefore, um, ba basically in the, in the first volume, in the Praxis, uh, the aliens, who are called the Shah, uh, die out, uh, naturally. Um, there's no revolution or anything. And so then you have the kind of political problems that happen if you're in a totalitarian uh, dictatorship and the dictator dies. And what do you replace the dictator with? There are people who want to just keep on going and put themselves in the role of the dictator. There are people who have whole other ideas. And in the, the first series, the problem was that the the senior of the um, uh, senior species in the empire, other than the founders, uh, decided that they were just going to step into the role of the founders. And so, in this, in the first series, uh, the problem was dealing with that—that that there were a whole bunch of uh, other people who were going to take over. And uh, the the series um, the series was saved by the readership. The after the first book, The Praxis, came out, um, I was told that sales figures were disappointing and they weren't really interested in, uh, in buying any more. And I, Caitlin Blaisdell, the acquiring editor, had, had moved on. She's an agent now. Um, and so there was, there was kind of no one left to really to go to bat for it. The second book so, uh, shipped twice as many copies as the first book, but by that point it was too late. The decision had been made. Um, and so the series was kind of allowed to die on the vine, except that it didn't die. People kept buying those books and reading them. And all of the books went through multiple printings, and they're all still available after 15 years. So by and by, uh, David Pomerico is now the editor at uh, HarperCollins. And he said, uh, Walter, why don't you write some more of these? And I had always intended to write more. Um, my original outline was going to cover, I think, nine to 12 volumes, depending on how early I got bored with it. Uh, but uh, um, so now I'm going to get to fulfill the plan, or at least more of the plan, that I'd actually started with 18 or 20 years ago.
and the first of those new series has just come out. Right, and that's the the Exodus Award that we're, we'll be talking about today. So what was the reaction on the part of the readership when you announced that the series was coming back after, as you said, this 18 or 20 year hiatus? Yes, there was, well, there was a lot. It was, there was, there was whooping, there was shouting, there was champagne being opened, there was dancing in the streets. Because uh, as I say, the readers were really saved this series. Um, it wasn't anything that I did. It wasn't anything that the publisher did. Uh, the readers just kept reading it and recommending it to their friends. Was this, was everything still fresh in your mind? Did you have to go back and reread the earlier books or did, did you? Uh, well, yeah, I did. Uh, I, I would have done that in any case, but I did really want to get back to the mindset that I was in 18 years ago as, you know, sort of a lot has happened, uh, in those 18 years. And I have written, uh, several other books. So, uh, I had to sort of go back and think, well, what was I thinking about 18 years ago? And uh, what was my view on this 18 years ago? But I had left myself some very detailed notes. If you're going to go into a large series like this, I strongly recommend uh, that if you're writing one of these, you should take a lot of notes. Hmm. Um, and so I had pages and pages and pages of them, uh, along with uh, possible plots and possible explanations. And the, the accidental war was actually in my concept from the beginning, from 20 years ago. Was there anything when you went back and looked at the books that you didn't remember or that you, looked, you that you saw in a, like something specific that you saw in a completely different light after all so much time had passed? Uh, yes, absolutely. Although I, I can't exactly think of an example. Um, the original series was written under a, a certain amount of deadline pressure. Um, and so uh, it, certain aspects of it weren't entirely 100% consistent, even in the original publication. And uh, I got the rights back to the first three books f outside of North America, and I issued them as my own ebooks after uh, rewriting them. So now there is the sort of author's approved edition. And Harper, when they are reissuing the original ones, are uh, incorporating the changes that I made uh, some years ago. So, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that those inconsistencies no longer exist. I mean, could, could you give an example of something that you changed when you went back and re rewrote the, the earlier books? Well, I'm, I'm, there was, there, there was a scene in which, uh, I realized that my character had done something that was physically impossible. Um, there was a, a high G turn uh, around a star, which if she had actually performed it, she would have ended up, you know, a bunch of stripped electrons thrown against the instrument panel. And so, uh, I changed that, for example. Um, and, uh, and ended up changing a number of other things with that. You know, I, I listened to an interview where you said that you, um, at what for one book, I'm not sure which book it was, but that you relied on a astronomy textbook that was ten years old and that actually yes, that was for the yes, that was the, that was for the original practice series, yes, the first three books. Yeah, um, that... my 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 source was ten years out of date, and certain terminologies had changed, and certain views of the universe had changed. and so um, uh, some of the astronomy in that was no longer uh, current. Uh, but as I say, I fixed that now. I mean, you say um, that you want to thank uh, Steve Howe for details of antimatter containment. So you, you yes. sort of brought in uh, some scientific advisors uh, for this mm -hmm. one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two in particular, Steve Howe um, is a, an antimatter uh, theorist, I guess, uh, who works at one of the labs uh, here in New Mexico where I live. And he has been uh, an advisor on how antimatter would work. This is an antimatter fueled universe, and it's particularly in the ships are antimatter fueled. Um, and there are certain problems with with that, that uh, that Steve has done a lot of thinking about. Um, and I uh, and he uh, very happily just allowed me to uh, use all of his ideas. Um, another was uh, the, the interstellar um, transportation in this series is done through wormholes. And so I contacted one of the great authorities on wormholes, who is Jeff Landis, who is uh, another science fiction writer, 
um, in addition to being a scientist. Uh, and he and Robert Forward and another colleague had written a definitive paper on wormholes back in the 80s. And when I contacted him in 2001 or whatever it was, um, he had, you know, he'd been working on so much stuff since that he actually had to go back and review <laughs> what he and Robert Forward and their other colleague had determined back then. Um, and uh, and he was he was a great help with the series. Well, so in this universe, a lot of the planets have these antimatter rings around them with space mm, yes. elevators. Could you talk about mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Um, this is this is again a thing that doesn't make a lot of rational sense, but it makes sense in the ways that pyramids make sense, which is that you create this enormous, profound uh, object um, to uh, tell the population on the planet below that you are more important than they are. Uh, so what it is, is it is a ring surrounding the planet uh, in the Clark orbit. It's an inhabited ring. Um, and among its other functions, uh, it can generate antimatter basically turn solar energy uh, into antimatter, which is then appropriately contained and used to power spaceships and a good deal of the stuff going on on the planet below. So, I mean, when you're talking to this guy, Steve Howe, what, what, what would be an example of something he told you about antimatter that you didn't know already? Um, uh, how it can be safely transported, which is that uh, anti-hydrogen, one, one single flake of anti-hydrogen can be suspended in a silicon chip by uh, static electricity uh, and will remain there happily for an indefinite period. Um, and until, um, you know, under other conditions, uh, you want to slam that uh, chip of antimatter against the silicon wall and then you get an enormous explosion. And that is, uh, that is one of his principal contributions to this ongoing scientific dialogue. Um, in other words, how you how you contain uh, all of these tiny microscopic silicon chips? Um, they they uh, they travel like a thick fluid. Um, if you actually succeeded in making these things, um, and then for the accidental war, I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but there is a situation in which some of the characters have to contemplate. Uh, Evading uh, some of the safety systems that have been set up to contain the antimatter, and uh, and Steve helped a lot with that too. Yeah, you also mentioned somebody named Oz Drummond, who you say helped out with the economics in the book. Yes, yes, um, she is uh, one of my I, one of my former students from uh, Tao's Toolbox, which is a a science fiction and fantasy writing workshop that I run every summer uh, in northern New Mexico, and. Uh, and she is, uh, by profession, works with uh, money and accountancy. And so she helped sort of focus some of my more unfocused ideas of the economics of how this empire works and how uh, money works in the empire um, and so on. Because I'm certainly not an expert on economics, but the there's a, an event that takes place in the book that reminds me a lot of the 2008 financial crisis. Is that a fair statement? I, well, I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, there is, is skullduggery in high places in the economic system, and this results in a uh, general collapse, which is um, aided in its uh, catastrophic nature by the government, which is uh, choosing um, to react to it in exactly the wrong way. I mean, again, so could you say something that, that she, um, you know, gave you that you wouldn't have come up with on your own in terms of the economics? Uh, it's not so much what I, what, uh, that she came up with something that she, that I didn't think of, but she explained to me how what I thought of would actually work. Hmm. Um, for instance, there's a, a, a section, there's a, a, a corrupt financier in this book who is uh, packaging bonds in certain ways. And, um, and when the, when the collapse happens, these bonds, which, uh, institutions have invested, uh, billions of dollars, well, billions of whatever the currency is, uh, suddenly find that, that once, once they unpack what they've actually purchased, it's worth less than zero. And suddenly they're on the hook for a lot of money. Um, and she explained to me how that would work. 
I mean, because it goes, this book goes into quite a bit of detail about the financial stuff. I mean, I think several dozen pages. Did you, um, were you concerned at all that readers would um, have a hard time following that or or not be interested in? uh, Well, I tried tried to explain it as as well as I could, but you see, it's it's all done through the point of view of my characters, who I hope by that point they have all um, invested in to a degree. But uh, I I, I find that, you know, in, in this modern world with so much, um, information available to the reader and with, uh, with some of the recent events, uh, in the last 20 years of financial history, um, you really have to, to walk people through it because you know this is how it, it would happen or one way that it could happen. You can't just say, oh, the economy came, came apart. Hmm. And so I have to have my characters participate, if only as observers, um, in this ongoing catastrophe. Right. I think that's a good observation that the the point of view character is not an economist. So she kind of has to have right. everything explained to her in, in layman's terms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, could you say a bit more? You mentioned that the, the society is governed by this alien code called the Praxis. Could you talk about how yes. this, this very ruthless sort of code? Could you come uh, talk about how you came up with that and, um, you know, just uh, what are some of the major features of it? Um, right. Well, one of the uh major features in it is that authority is absolute which is is true of any traditional earth monarchy uh they all tried to turn themselves into this um that uh louis the 14th said i am the state um certainly uh, chinese emperors uh viewed themselves that way and they had the the theories of confucius in in, in confucius everybody uh has a certain place in the order, and there are superiors and there are inferiors, and you are obliged to uh, follow the instructions of your superiors, even if they are wrong and illegal. You are allowed to admonish them. For instance, if your father tells you to commit a crime, you can point out, this is a crime. We shouldn't be committing crimes. But if your father insists, you have to go out and commit the crime. That's Confucianism. That's how that works. So what what is going on with the praxis is that uh, in many ways, it's kind of a a fundamentalist tyranny, except that the fundamentalism is atheistic and not based on religion. So one thing that fundamentalists have in common is they think they've all got it figured out, Um, that if only we go back to this ideal state, then uh, everything will work out. Uh, And so the Shah, the alien conquerors, um, have this philosophy. Uh, They impose it on the alien species. Uh, there are, they are the superiors. They get to decide what happens and when and to whom. Um, there is also a kind of uh, parliament called the convocation, and these are um, rich, influential, and highly connected uh, aristocracy. And the, the aristocracy was formed because the Shah. There, there weren't that many of them to begin with. And so they needed, if they were going to rule uh, these alien species, they needed um, helpers. And so the aristocracy started out as collaborators. I mean, if you are conquered by, uh, if your nation is conquered by another nation, you have a number of choices. You can resist, in which case um, you stand a good chance of being killed. You can just try and go about your business and keep your head down and not come to anyone's attention, or even actively aid uh, the invaders uh, and help them. And that's who these aristocrats originally were. They were the people who collaborated with the conquerors against their own species and were richly rewarded. And now the elite of the elite are sitting in this kind of parliament, and they can uh, they can suggest legislation. Um, they can't actually enforce it because they just pass it up to the Shah and the Shah decide whether to accept it or not. The Shah are sort of like the king in this system. But now, as in the praxis, the the last of the Shah are dead. So what you have is this parliamentary body that is used to, um, they're essentially trained to come up with these ideas and pass them on to higher authority, but now they are the higher authority. 
uh, and they, you know, they used to be really good at, at flattering and sucking up to the Shah, but the Shah aren't there anymore. Um, so what do they do then? Uh, do they try? They're trying their best to become the Shah, but they really don't have the chops to do it. Uh, that's just not in their DNA. I heard you describe an, an Amazon review where someone was complaining that this hereditary monarchy system was not dismantled by the end of the book. Uh, yeah, well, there is there's a certain type of. I guess more military space uh, science fiction than space opera, but um, where the the whole point is that at the end um, you overthrow the tyrant and you establish a um, American style democratic republic because everybody in the future should aspire to be uh, as perfect as we are here. <laughs> um, and you know I don't buy that. I think they would come up with solutions of their own. Uh, and in this case, it was the the received authority, the, the the parliament, if you will, that is being challenged by this whole other species. So um, the war in the first series is to establish the authority of this parliament. Um, the second series, beginning with the accidental war, is what happens when the authority of the parliament falls apart. You know, one of my favorite books growing up was The Moat in God's Eye by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. And mm -hmm. there's an essay at the back of that book that's really striking where they say basically that most civilizations throughout human history have been hereditary monarchies. And there's no reason to think yeah. there wouldn't be a hereditary monarchy in the future. And they even say that hereditary monarchy has some advantages, like that you can um, – that the person who rules has been trained from childhood to rule and isn't just somebody with no background in uh, government to, you know, being thrust mm -hmm. into that position and things like that. Uh, um, I, I would actually dispute that uh, because if you look at the successors of successful monarchs, uh, very often they were trained, the successors were trained to be ineffectual so that they would not be a threat to their predecessors. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, for example, you know, Louis. Louis the Fourteenth had quite a number of children, but he did not train them to be king, not any of them. <laughs> um, and and then his direct heir died, and he had grandchildren. He didn't train them either. And then yeah, they we, died, and, we all and know left how a that five. Out. Yeah, left, well, they left a five-year-old on the throne, um, <laughs> who was apparently a perfectly amiable person, but never succeeded in being a very effective king. Um, and so the the. The choice mechanism. I mean, if we're we're sort of used to the English idea of primogeniture, but a lot of monarchies in the past, um, you didn't necessarily choose the eldest male child. You would choose uh, somebody from the royal family. They had to have royal blood, but it could be any of them. Um, in 19th century China, um, it had to be someone from the royal family who was of the next generation than the predecessor. So you, you couldn't pick the emperor's brother or something because he'd be the same generation. So you'd you'd go down one, and that was uh, part of the crisis of the Chinese monarchy in the late 19th century is the heirs kept dying after a couple years. And eventually you ended up with Puyi, who was like a three-year-old emperor, but he was like the most likely of that generation hmm. because none of his uncles or aunts or great uncles or great aunts were uh, were allowed by the rules of succession to take over. Um, I mean, so do you the, think the point of the point of the practice is there is only there is it is, everything that is important has already been worked out, and all we need to do is put everything in place. And if everybody just does their job, we'll have an ideal society. Well, right. Like you make a point of noting that the technology has not advanced for centuries at the point that right. this book picks up. Picks up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, part of the part of the practice is that certain technologies are just forbidden. You may not have artificial intelligence. Um, you may not have uh, immortality. Um, and that's because these are a, a direct threat to um, the, the Shah, the original ruling people. So how do they feel? I mean, they must be aware of the potential that they, they might some unknown alien civilization that does have more advanced technology might come in and conquer them? Or is that something that's not something they think about? That's not quite on their radar. Mm. Um, uh, and, and, and such speculation would be thoroughly discouraged. 
in, in perhaps lethal ways, mm-hmm. if anyone were to actually theorize that. I thought um, their their theory is everything we have is already perfect. We don't need anything more. Yeah. I thought this line was interesting. You say most peers preferred the fleet with its pomp, its rigid traditions, and its glamorous social hierarchy. And there does seem to be something oddly glamorous about social hierarchy that people are drawn to it, like the British, you know, like Americans are drawn to the British royal family or something, like the the wedding. Yeah. Um, out of all proportion to how beneficial or what advantages that it actually has in the real world. Well, yeah. I th- well, I think people are attracted to the simplicity of something like feudalism. Where you just got very strict social classes, you've got the royalty, you've got the nobility, you've got the knights, you've got the peasants. And um, and once again, you know, the relationship between each of these is very carefully defined. And if you actually research the Middle Ages, which I've done for my other series, Quillifer, you'll find that it wasn't at all like that. But that's sort of the picture that we all have. The, the, the real Middle Ages was complicated and very weird. Um, and there were all sorts of things happening that were just not a part of this traditional picture that we've we've been raised with. So uh, now I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> uh, is there something glamorous about social hierarchy that draws yeah, people to yeah. it? Yeah, well, you know, uh, it's it's the same thing that draws you to, say, Dracula. I mean, he's very sophisticated and he's very good looking and he dresses well, um, you know, and uh, but he will suck your blood. All right. And that's kind of how the aristocracy works in the practice universe. Um, and there are levels within the aristocracy. Uh, also, um, my major character, Sula, for example, is ostensibly from the very highest ranks of the peers. Uh, my other principal hero. Uh, Gareth Martinez is, uh, he is a peer, but he's a provincial peer. So the peers in the capital look down on him uh, because he just doesn't have the breeding uh, to keep up with them. Um, and and his he, uh, he finds himself with a burning need to prove these people wrong on every possible occasion, um, which doesn't always do him the, do him a lot of good. I mean, would you say that there's something that draws you to writing about this sort of ruthless hierarchical society, or would you just be just as happy writing about a, a Star Trek style enlightened egalitarian civilization? Um, if if I, I don't know that I've got anything to add to that. Uh, I, actually, I do. It was called Aristoi. Hmm. My my book from 1992 was a uh, a glamorous and functional aristocracy. I was responding to Francis Fukuyama's The End of History where he suggested that from now on it's just going to be liberal uh, democracies all the way down, as it were. And so because I'm I'm a perverse contrarian, I thought, I'm going to find a way to make uh, absolute tyranny uh, not only uh, logical but necessary, and I did. So how what made it ne- what made absolute ty- tyranny necessary? Several technologies that were incredibly lethal. And that had to be controlled. So this is like super nuclear weapons, and anything is justified to keep them out of the wrong hands. Well, na- nanotechnology—they have control of gravity, um, which means you can cause things to fly apart. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, which wouldn't be healthy for children or other living things. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, there has to be an absolute control on that. On the other hand, it is an egalitarian tyranny to the effect that anybody can become a tyrant. There's just a very rigid series of exams that you have to pass. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Oh, no, I'll have to check that book out. I haven't read that one. Um, you mentioned that the praxis that they're atheists. I was just curious where that idea came from. Um, I, uh, well, uh, honestly, I don't know. I just felt that the, the, the Shah would not, would not invoke religion. They are, um, from their own point of view, very rational and scientific. Uh, and so uh, supernatural is another thing that, if you believe in, will get you into trouble. Um, and it's it's not that religion doesn't exist, it's just that it doesn't exist openly. And there's no institutionalized religion, it's just, you know, little congregations of people. I, I've lived in New Mexico for a great many decades, and... Uh, one thing that New Mexico specializes in is really odd religions. 
Um, we have the Penitenti Brotherhood. We have uh, crypto Jews who are um, Jewish people who fled from Spain and Portugal in the 16th century and to the most remote, remote corner of the Spanish Empire, which turned out to be New Mexico, um, and still have their own uh, practices and uh, and I, I guess you'd call it congregations, uh, groups of people um, who practice their religion in secret because once upon a time, if you practiced it openly, the Inquisition would get you. So uh, I met at one point, in one of the stories, uh, Martinez mentions that on his home planet, which is called Laredo, um, they do have Christians, and that what these Christians do is once a year they pick one of one person to be their god and they nail him to a cross. And that is what used to happen here in New Mexico. So they say they don't do that anymore. Uh, but uh, that still happens in the Philippines, which is another place where the penitentes fled to uh, in the 17th century. And this is they don't kill the person. They they nail. No, no, they, they no, no. They don't. They don't stab him with a spear or anything. But they nail him to a cross and leave leave him there for a while. And it, it it's uh, supposedly if you go into some of the smaller Spanish villages in New Mexico and you see some guy with uh, really heavy scarring on his palms, um, you know that uh, that he's a very well respected person because they don't they don't nail just anybody. They, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they nail their, um, or nailed, I should say, they, uh, the most respected people in the community. You know, it's funny because listening to interviews with you, you seem to have mixed feelings about New Mexico, but you've lived there <laughs> pretty much your whole I do life. live here, yeah. Uh, pretty proud, as for nearly 50 years, I guess. Um, on and off, but mostly on. Um, well, New Mexico has. Uh, a lot of advantages, particularly if you're um, in the creative arts, that uh, there is a really large and interesting and diverse creative community here. Um, you have uh, quite a lot of uh, varying cultures that have somehow managed to live together uh, successfully for hundreds of years. Um, you do, but it is very poor. Um, the edu edu educational system is a catastrophe and has been since I was in school. There just isn't enough money to run a proper educational system. Um, what else? There's a weird post-colonial history that uh, interferes with development in certain ways. That, that although all of these groups, the Anglos and the Hispanics and the Native Americans and so on, have worked out ways of power sharing, um, this also means that they get to share in everything else. So if if somebody comes in and says, well, we want to build a, uh, for example, a uh, Facebook plant here uh, uh, to store our Facebook servers, um, the first thing that the politicians are going to ask is not, is this good for New Mexico, but is this good for my crowd? Um, and so a lot of these little groups, uh, you know, will stand in the way of anything until they get a piece of it. Um, and so it's sort of like the mafia, except without violence. But I mean, I guess one thing that's keeping you there is you have this great group of other science fiction writers. I mean, you're in the you you hang out with George R. R. Martin and Melinda Snodgrass and uh, Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, right? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, and and we have all been friends for many many years, and. Uh, and I, I think we probably influenced each other to a certain degree. Um, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been terrific. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, they, they were all part of my role playing group, you know. But, and uh, seeing actual science fiction writers playing in a role playing game is really interesting, particularly if they've had dramatic training. Um, and uh, they don't do role playing quite like anyone else. That uh, you know that they're they're madly uh, inhabiting a character just like they would if they were writing or acting and uh, and all of those interactions became the most interesting part of the experience and ultimately it grew into uh, George Martin's wildcard series which started out with a role-playing game that we were all heavily invested in uh, George more than anyone else uh, and now that series has gone on for 26 27 volumes 
I mean, Roger Zelazny was part of that group, actually, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, yes. He wasn't so much into the role playing, but he was uh, uh, part of the science fiction community, uh, along with um, Jack Williamson. Um, Stephen R. Donaldson is here. Victor Milan, who who passed away earlier this year. Uh, we, we, it was it was quite a, a tight and uh, interesting crew. Do you have any memories from the the role playing sessions that kind of stick out in your mind? Uh, unfortunately, they would probably require more than an hour of content. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you ran a, a a a campaign set in ancient Rome, right? I did, yes. Um, one of the writers uh, here is uh, John Maddox Roberts, and uh, in addition to being a science fiction and fantasy writer, he has uh, a a long running series of mysteries set in the late Roman Republic. Um, and I uh, I read all of those and liked them quite a bit, and so I set up uh, my own role playing campaign. Um, not necessarily based on his ideas, but uh, in that milieu, just because I found it very interesting. Um, the late Roman Republic is another one of those periods in history that uh, that strongly resembles our own. And uh, and like the world of the Praxis, it has a, a Senate um, that is uh, strongly divided into factions, and that is being corrupted by a vast amount of money. Um, and that was that essentially was the crisis of the late Roman Republic that uh, suddenly a whole lot of money came in uh, and it changed the political process quite a bit. I was actually thinking, you know, there's a very good, very popular podcast called the History of Rome podcast that I listened to. And ah, okay. the, the patronage system in the praxis reminded me a little bit of, of one of the things it was talking about in ancient Rome, where I, I, I forget there was one period where a huge portion of the population was unemployed and they would just kind of go um, from house to house calling on their patrons and being fed and yeah yeah the the patrons were obliged to look after their underlings um and in fact that is that uh has um that system of patron client has continued uh into the present day in new mexico but it was so well established in the roman empire that uh in the latin world um, it, it still exists. Uh, here we talk about the, the five northern New Mexico families or the seven northern New Mexico families who are, um, who, you know, very influential Hispanic families who kind of run everything. So um, you're saying that really they, the praxis is inspired by New Mexico, basically? Yeah, well, more by New Mexico than I think by ancient Rome, but uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you mentioned that the – oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say there is a reason why you know one of my heroes is named Martinez, and and, <laughs> and he comes from a place called Laredo. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that the the different people we were talking about, these other authors that you've all influenced each other. Could you think of any mm -hmm. uh, examples of of how you've influenced each other? Uh, well, for one thing, we we a lot of us uh, have belonged to various critique groups over the years, so um, over time we've got direct feedback. Uh, from some very talented writers on our work. Um, so I think that's, that's the most obvious thing. But, um, but occasionally, you know, someone will, will, will just point out something that I've missed in my own world. Uh, recently, um, this, this is, wasn't a New Mexico writers group, but somebody who had been reading through my fingers. Well, you know, you've established that these canon are really unreliable and, 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 you know, or, or want to explode. And when it, when your character is using one, shouldn't he worry about it? And maybe he, it should explode. And I went, oh yeah, you're right. Okay. And just just the other day, I wrote that scene. Um, so that 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 is in my other series, though. It's not in the practice. I guess I'll mention that. Um, you know, I mentioned Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank. If people don't know, yeah. they are combined James S.A. Corey, who writes the Expanse mm -hmm. novels that the, the show is yeah. based on. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously George R. R. Martin has has had big success in television as well. Kind of what's it been like having these people that you know well have these uh, TV shows made out of their Well, it's, uh, it's, it's actually pretty terrific. Um, you know, I, I, I confess to a certain amount of, of uh, jealousy <laughs> insofar as I seem to be the only kid on my block without a TV contract. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's... Uh, 
it, it's great uh, that people I know and admire are getting noticed by people outside of um, you know our rather small science fiction community. Do you think that there's been any influence uh, either way between the the expanse and um, the the praxis? Uh, well, you would have to ask ad address that question to Daniel and Ty more than me, uh, but I know that they they are both Praxis fans, um, and were uh, greeted the the uh, renewal of the series with uh, with uh, great uh, joy and relief. I think so. Yeah, no, I, I mean the Expanse is my favorite show on TV, and I was tweeting yeah. like crazy uh, during the Save the Expanse campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm so glad it worked out for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Ty is, Ty is even now going off. Uh, you know, he's off in, in, in Canada dealing with the filming of the, the Series 4. Um, and Daniel is here writing one of the novels. So, uh, you know, so so they're doing well. What can I say? Yeah, no, that's really cool. And they're they're very talented people, and I like them a lot. And I'm just very glad that they are such a success. Yeah. I saw that uh, one of your books uh, was called Deep State, that you basically predicted the Arab Spring. Could you talk about that? I, I sort of did, yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 it's, uh, it's, uh, it's part of a series of uh, near-future thrillers um, about a, a game designer named Dagmar Shaw. And um, I've been getting some complaints, reviews, and so on, saying this isn't science fiction. But it was when I wrote back in 2008, um, and uh, and it, it turns out to be that I predicted a lot of things that actually did happen. Um, but one of them was a uh, revolution in the Middle East propelled by social media, um, and uh, my character uh, was um, involved in in actually doing that in uh, sort of creating the revolution and convincing the people who were doing the revolution that it was all their idea. So basically astroturfing an entire country. Um, so um, my specific predictions for how the, the Arab Spring was going to play out um, were kind of hit and miss. But when I was, but the, the, uh, and the book came out the week that the Arab Spring actually kicked off. I, I thought it would be like seven or eight years in the future. I could see it coming, but I was um, not so accurate at figuring out when it was going to happen. Uh, but it turns out that the Middle East is a lot more wired than I thought it was. Um, but yes, uh, so basically the book became obsolete the day it appeared. Hmm. I mean, did that give you an opportunity then? If you're, um, I don't know if you were on a book you would have thought so. To... <laughs> no. no. <laughs> My my agent called like every media in New York, and none of them were interested. They had their own experts. Thank you. Um, and uh, I did get um, some calls from um, agencies that re will remain nameless um, in our nation's capital, um, asking me how I knew. And you know, the only answer I could give was it's kind of obvious, but. But anyway, that, you know, there, there was some interest from that quarter. Uh, was the tenor of those phone calls like, wow, how did you know? Or like suspicious, how did you know? No, no, no. It was, it was, uh, you know, the, this, this whole thing just wasn't on their radar, the, the, the possibilities of social media. Um, and uh, so, yeah, they just, they, they, they wanted to know how I knew this was going to happen. And I, you know, I could trace it. Well, this is what's happening over here. And this is what's happening over here. And this is this group off in Serbia that's uh, trying to promote nonviolent ways to achieve democracy. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I was able to point them in certain directions. It wasn't, um, but yeah, they weren't, they, they weren't suspicious. I mean, it's, if if I were if I were a spy or a bad actor, I wouldn't put it all in a novel. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you were I, really be... dastardly masterminds, so and you're just like, yeah, right. throwing people off the scent. Yeah, I you know, but I you know, if I wanted to actually do this kind of stuff, I'd be in Russia right now, um, uh, posting uh, fake news to Facebook. You know. 
So, so it didn't lead to a, a, a sideline career as a, a policy analyst or anything like that? Uh, not really. I'm still waiting for my country to call. Hmm. I mean, because there's, there's, a, there's a consortium of science fiction authors who have advised the government in the past, right? Like a bunch of the yes. hard science fiction authors? Uh, yes, yeah, and, and I am, I am in fact uh, part of that group. Uh, but um, you know, you you don't exactly know where that's going to go. You know, I made some suggestions, and there was follow up on it, but I don't know if it was because I made the suggestion or somebody much better placed than me made the suggestion. Wait, wait, sorry, could you say, say that again? So, so you, so. You suggested something, and it, and it did get somewhere within the government, or it did. Yeah, it did. It, you know, it was announced that 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 technology that I'd suggested was under development, um, which was uh, it, it was a tech. I won't get into details, but it was a technology that would have saved some lives. Okay, which is principally the sorts of technology that I'm interested in, uh, and and that technology was subsequently developed. Now, I do not claim that this is all down to me. Because I don't know, uh, you know, it's it, 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 again, it was a technology that seemed kind of obvious. Um, so it, it may well be that some other bright spark thought of it and was better connected to me and and I had the ability to bring it into um, into fruition. Mm, I see. I mean, so when your agent was calling all around. Um... And 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 you couldn't get booked on in any media. You, you, why do you think that? Why do you think that is? Or how do you feel about that situation? Well, uh, you know, it was a breaking situation. They had they all had their own Middle East experts who were you know on camera pontificating. Um, you know, possibly the fact that I was a science fiction writer would have put them off. Uh, but I don't I don't know the reason. They, I just know that they weren't interested. I mean, because, yeah, I saw in an interview you said uh, nobody outside the field gives a damn what science fiction writers think or do. Um, yeah, yeah, well, that's certainly my experience. Do you th- was it always like that? Because I feel like Asimov or Clark, people care uh-huh. what they said about issues, or maybe I'm criticizing. Um, there was, it was a, well, uh, I, I have to say I wasn't exactly around then, so I don't know. Um, they certainly created some ideas that other people then exploited um you know and i and i don't know how how uh you know clark uh came up with the idea well or at least popularized the idea of geosynchronous satellites and so on um i don't know whether that was actually his idea or whether he just popularized it uh also space elevators that was a big thing with him um asimov also had credentials as a physicist, a chemist, and a writer of popular science books. Um, so so he had he had credentials outside the science fiction world that might have enabled him to be taken more seriously. Um, and of course they both worked with El Spray de Camp during the Second World War at the Philadelphia Navy Naval Yard. Um, but once again I don't know what it was that they were doing there. I think they were just some kind of think tank. So it sounds like you just need to pick up a quick PhD in physics uh, to bolster your. Uh, yeah, there you go. Speaking. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can take care of that this weekend. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. Part part of the reason I started doing this podcast is because you know because I was writing science fiction and I I, I found it frustrating how uh, seldom science fiction writers were asked their opinions about weighty topics and I thought, oh, well, if I if I start my own talk show, then you know mm-hmm. nobody can yeah, stop me from expressing go. my opinions. Yeah. Uh, that's the way to do it. That's how I started a writer's workshop. This is the the Taos that toolbox. I thought Taos toolbox, yeah, um, which I I call a master class in science fiction and fantasy, uh, and uh, I teach it with Nancy Cress and with um, guest speakers like George R. R. Martin and Carrie Vaughn um, and Emily Motippitz, who is a uh, sort of a self pub guru and. Uh, and I, there was sort of a period in which I was thinking a whole lot of my friends were going into MFA programs, and I was thinking of doing this myself. Um, this is a more sort of stable way of earning a living. And then I thought, well, if I get an MFA, there's only a 20% chance that I'll ever be employed, and odds are it's going to be a liberal arts college in 
small town Midwest and I won't want to live there anyway. And so I'll just start my own. <laughs> and that's what I did. Uh, so I, I basically started my own college in a, in a, in a ski town in Northern New Mexico. And it has been a great success. We've had a bunch of absolutely terrific graduates. Uh, Kelly Robeson, Saladin Ahmed, um, uh, list goes on and on. And uh, is there a website for that? There is, taustoolbox.com. Yeah, so everyone can check that out. I saw that actually um, there's a, an astronaut who does uh, give a damn what science fiction writers do, right? Because he took your uh, implied spaces to the International Space Station. That's pretty cool. Yes, uh, Colonel Mike Fink. Yeah. Um, he, uh, of course, of course uh, when, when astronauts carry stuff up into orbit, uh, they have to provide a list. And uh, Mike Fink is a science fiction reader. And so he took one of my books up. Uh, and they noticed this in his NASA people noticed this in his uh, in his file, uh, and so they um, one of the things that NASA ground crew uh, like to do is try and make sure that the astronauts aren't bored. So uh, they um, uh, so we we uh, we had a surprise meeting um, on on video with each other. Uh, he was just told, "Well, you're going to talk to somebody interesting," and so we. Ended up uh, when he got back to Earth, uh, doing some hanging out um, at the. Uh, he was a guest speaker at the uh, Nebula Weekend a few years ago, which I uh, I managed to get him the gig for that. Um, and he was he was a delightful guest speaker. But one of the interesting things I thought about him, he's a very smart guy, and he spent the first three days just watching the people who were there. <laughs> Right, and watching them interact so that he would know how to get to them, right? He, he uh, knew how to, how to address his conversation to that particular audience. Um, and he did a brilliant job of it. Also gave a tour for some of us of the uh, Air and Space Museum, which uh, he didn't have to do. And that was pretty neat, too. And he was able to, uh, uh, you know, he, he was able to point to a Russian spacesuit because I've worn that spacesuit and here are the good things about it and here are the bad things about it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so what would you say that he, like, when, what, what would you say that he had picked up about communicating science to a, an audience of science fiction? Fans? Uh, he, he had picked up a, a lot of our lingo, I think, uh, particularly writing lingo. He, he sat in on one of my writing workshops, not because he wants to become a science fiction writer, but just because he wanted to, you know, pick up some jargon that he could use. Uh -huh. That's cool. I'm also I'm just looking at my notes that you uh, you said that you workshopped um, the accidental war at the Rio Hondo workshop. Uh, I, I workshopped a part of it. Yes. Rio Hondo is another of the workshops that I run. That's a peer workshop. I don't actually do any teaching on that. That is a sort of um, Milford style workshop of uh, about a dozen professional writers uh, interacting with each other and critiquing each other's work and cooking fabulous food, which hmm. is kind of an accidental thing that happened, but now it's an established tradition. I mean, is there anything in the accidental war that's not a spoiler that you could point to that got tweeted? Well, I think, uh, um, well, Oz, Oz Drummond, uh, who we mentioned earlier, was in fact a uh, participant in that workshop. And so I was, uh, dis I submitted the chapters that were describing the economic collapse because. I didn't want uh, chapters about economics to be really boring, and I wanted to find out if they would hold everyone's interest. And and uh, they held her interest to the extent where she was dissecting the economics in it and 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 telling me you know what would work and what wouldn't. Yeah, no, I I think it definitely works because I I found them pretty interesting. And and like I said, I'm not a an expert on economics or anything, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Um, all right, so we're pretty much out of time. Um, and do you have any other uh, any other final thoughts or any other projects you wanted to mention? I, I do have another project. Um, I, it was very interesting. I sold two three books three book series in the same month a few years ago, and uh, and the other one, which is uh, out from Saga, is called Quillifer, and it's a high fantasy uh, series. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the, you know, uh, but, but because I, it, it's a science fiction writer's approach to fantasy, I think, 
because I, I just got fascinated by how things actually work um, in a society with that level of technology and how you can break down such things as, you know, magic and dragons uh, and make them um, seem seem more real to me. Um, and so the, the first book is, is out, uh, came out last year, and it's uh, been widely reviewed and favorably reviewed. And uh, this, I just finished writing the second book last night. Oh, wow. That's so that's I'm going to, you know, do some do some final polishing and send it off to the publisher tonight. So it, it's been a busy week for me. I've got, you know, <laughs> a new book out, a new book just finished, and uh, all sorts of other things going on. Could you give an example of how you make magic or a dragon seem more believable? Okay, well, um, magic, magic, I decided, is the violation of natural law by human will. Okay? Um, and what I never understood about uh, a lot of fantasy is that if magic is all this potent, how come the magicians aren't actually running everything? And um, I wanted to be in a world where the magicians weren't running everything because my hero is not a magician. Um, so uh, I decided to go back to some sort of Renaissance ideas of how magic worked. And their idea was that in order for magic to work, uh, the magician has to be in a state of ritual purity. And which means he has to isolate himself and fast and chant and pray and you know whatever other other ceremonies are and then and then the, the spell itself might take days to cast um so you know you, you can't be an evil dictator and you know every so often just doesn't excuse me i have to go chant for 12 days now um you know what because somebody would just stick a knife into you in the middle of that uh spell casting and that would be the end of you hmm. uh so uh i managed to be sort of authentic to my assumed period uh, and still kind of work out um, how magic works. Um, you know, that if you, if it fails, you don't know if your theory is wrong or the spell is wrong or if you fail to be ritually pure for part of this process. You, you said that idea of the ritual purity comes out of the Renaissance. Is there, are there, a, is there like a certain um, source for that or like magical text or something that, that says that? Um, well, I, I, I think the best example of it that's available to everybody uh, would be uh, John Crowley's Egypt series, which takes Renaissance magic very seriously and explains how it works. And so you have John D. off in Vienna doing a three-day ritual. Um, and uh, and that was something that sort of stuck in my mind when I read that uh, 25 years ago. Um, and, uh, uh, and I was able to make use of it. No, it's really cool. Yeah. I mean, John Crowley's great. I, I interviewed him within the past year and he's just a really interesting guy. Yeah. I, I listened to that interview. That was a great interview, oh. by the way. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, all right. Yeah. So that's Quillifer that you've been talking about. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll just throw in, um, your short story novella, the green leopard plague. I, I just love oh, it. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that uh, that is available, I should say, in an anthology called The Green Leopard Plague and Other Stories, which <laughs> has um, quite a number of my, well, two of my Nebula winning stories and, and some other stories that were nominated for one thing or another but didn't win uh, for reasons incomprehensible to me. <laughs> so. <laughs> but yeah, so everyone go check that out too, the, the Green Leopard Plague and Other Stories, which funnily enough includes the story of the Green Leopard Plague. Yeah. Um, and and then yeah, and then we've also been talking about. I mean, um, Walter mentioned Quillifer, and then of course this this uh, the new novel in the Praxis series is called The Accidental mm -hmm. War. So everyone go go check all those out. And... Yeah, please do. <laughs> I I don't want to I don't want to spend my golden years uh, living in a cardboard box on a on a steam grate. So yeah. <laughs> buy my books, guys. <laughs> all right, so I think that's a good, that's a good note to end on. So we'll uh, wrap this up there. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> but... <laughs> All right. So we've been speaking with Walter John Williams. And so, Walter, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it was a pleasure. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Walter John Williams for joining us on the show. 
Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Elsa Tangia and Gudino. Elsa Tangia writes, Wow, this is such a good podcast. I just listened to episode 323 on Sorry to Bother You. I already knew that I needed to see this movie, but this might be a rare case where I will be happy to have heard this discussion of the movie before I see the movie. It is so great to get this super good panel together on this topic. As in other episodes, this one is interesting, mind-opening, and inspirational. I feel much more optimistic about the future after listening to this. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is the only podcast for which I listen to every podcast. Even if it's on a topic that I don't think I'm interested in, I know that David will bring a lot of interesting information into it and will change my mind. Fantastic. So big thanks again to Elsa Tangia for that great review. Special thanks as well to J. Sal Adkins and Jonathan Gudino, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.